to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in john chapter 14 verse number six jesus said i am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. As you think about the words of Jesus throughout the New Testament, Jesus, as it relates to doctrinal matters, salvation, His teaching, was indeed narrow-minded. Now don't get me wrong, Jesus was open to all who were willing to obey the gospel coming to Him. He said, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven, Matthew 7, 21. And yet at the same time, Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And so today in our study of more about Jesus, we think about the narrow-minded nature of Jesus' teaching and the exclusivity of some of his principles concerning Christ himself and Christian living. As always, we welcome you to today's study. We're so glad that you joined us as we learn more together about the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As always, these lessons are brought to you by members of the Lord's Church. If you'd like to have a copy of this series of lessons or any of our lessons, we encourage you to write to us or call us or visit us on our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From that website, you can order free videos or CDs of our lessons, as well as a host of Bible study materials that are available free of charge. And if you've got a question or a Bible study idea or something that you've been thinking about, we'd love to help you with that in any way that we can. Also, we encourage you to visit the Church of Christ in your area. In your town, you'll find people in the Lord's Church who are concerned about the Bible and who love lost souls and who would love to sit down and visit with you more. As we think today about the narrow-minded nature of some of Jesus' teaching, we all realize that we likely live in a world that doesn't like to be narrow-minded about certain things. We live in a society that wants to be open and have so many open views, and yet, is that really what Jesus taught? We live in a world that says, just choose the church of your choice. God will be happy with that. We live in a world that says, whatever kind of marriage you want, whether that between, be between two men or a man and a woman or two women, that's okay. And we should never be exclusive on those ideas. And yet, God is exclusive in His teaching in the New Testament. For example, as you think about the narrow-minded nature of Jesus, one of the things that the Lord was indeed narrow-minded about was righteous living. Listen to his words in Matthew 5, verse 20. As he's teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. What was wrong with the scribes and Pharisees' teaching? They were saying, but not doing, according to Matthew 23. They went halfway around the world to make a proselyte, and then Jesus said, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. And so when Jesus thought about things where he was indeed restrictive about, one of those was righteous living. Friend, as you think about living for Christ, and the seriousness of it and what that really means. Jesus exemplifies that in Luke chapter 2, verse number 49, as Jesus' parents almost chastise him for leaving the, the group and not being with the caravan, Jesus, when asked, why did you leave? Where were you? Responds by saying, did you not know? I must be about my father's business. Friend, that's the mindset that every child of God needs. Righteous living is not an optional matter. It is something God demands of his children. Do you remember Romans 12, verses 1 and 2? The apostle Paul said, I beg you, 
by the mercies of God, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. What do you mean, Paul? Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be transformed to this world, but do not be uh, conformed to this world, but be transformed, renewed by the transforming of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As you think about Christ and, and really living and having that exclusive, restricted nature of living for Christ, when we're talking about making real sacrifices every day to live for Jesus. Listen to Jesus' words in Luke 9, verse 23. Jesus said, If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Paul would say to Christians in Corinth, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, listen now, and you are not your own, for you are bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are His. I belong to Christ. My life is no longer about self. I've got to live for God and for Christ every day. Now, friend, let me give you a prime example of what we're talking about when we think about real righteous living that is exclusive, that follows the pattern of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul probably serves as a great pattern for what that means. Paul exemplified his life, now that's been transformed to live for Christ, in Galatians 2, verse 20. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Christ lives in me. This life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. And so as we think about this idea, we want to emphasize that Christian living is indeed something that Jesus wants us to do 100%. It can't be half-hearted. It can't be lackadaisical. We've got to be serious about living for Christ in every way. You know, when I think about things that Jesus was really exclusive, restricted about, narrow-minded about, it was being converted. Conversion, changing one's process, changing one's mind to really live for Christ is indeed a total change. In Matthew 18, verse number 3, Jesus illustrated this by saying, Unless you are converted and become as one of these little children, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. The context is some had brought children to Jesus and the disciples don't think Jesus needs to be dealing with children and so they kind of rebuked them for bringing these children to Jesus and Jesus said, wait a minute now, let the little children come to me, do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus will say, unless you become like one of these little children, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. What is it Jesus is trying to emphasize about conversion that is so restricted in its nature there? Friend, unless I'm willing, and unless we're willing to completely give up, to trust Jesus, follow Him, and commit 100% to the conversion process, I cannot be what God really wants me to be. I've got to make sure that I recognize Jesus must have 100% of everything. You know, a lot of it is about trust. What made Jesus use the illustration of children? Children trust their parents implicitly and without doubt usually. Friend, isn't that the way we ought to do with God? Once we've looked to the Word of God, once we've seen its truthfulness, once we recognize Jesus is the Son of God, in that conversion, I need to trust Jesus fully. Remember Proverbs 3, verse number 5? Here's what we're talking about. The proverb writer said, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways. He will direct your paths. I've got to give all my heart to the Lord. There can't be doubt. There can't be 95% the Lord, 5% me. The conversion process must be total commitment to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, let me give you a, a couple of illustrations about this that I think from Jesus' teaching help us to understand it better. Man comes to Jesus and he's a pretty good man, we might say. He comes to Jesus with a great question. Here's his question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
And in Mark chapter 10, Jesus addresses this rich young ruler and he says, uh, keep the commandments. Do not murder, do not steal, do not commit adultery, honor your father and mother. And the man comes back to Jesus and says, all this I've done from childhood. Jesus said, one thing you lack. Wait a minute, this man has been keeping those commandments. What is it that he lacks? Sell what you have, give to the poor, come follow me. The Bible says that man went away sorrowful because he had great riches. That man hadn't really been fully converted. He hadn't fully given up everything to follow Jesus. Are we saying it's wrong to have things? That's not what Jesus is teaching, nor is that the idea. But the idea is full commitment to the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Full conversion to His cause that would cause one to do what the Lord said in Revelation 2.10. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. And so what does the Lord want of His children? He wants us to fully convert to the idea of trusting Him, following Him, and doing whatever He says so that ultimately we can have the crown of life. Now, a third thing that Jesus was indeed narrow-minded about was the essentiality of repentance or changing our mind. In Luke chapter 13, we have an illustration of this. Uh, in Luke 13, Jesus is going to teach about repentance, but what leads him to this is certain people think they're better than others and they're kind of looking down on maybe people who they believe God's wrath has been exhibited toward. And so they come to Jesus and they say, uh, Lord, what about these 18 people who are walking down the road and a tower falls on them. Weren't they worse sinners than everybody else? Or, or what about these Galileans who Pilate mingled their blood with their sacrifice, meaning that they were killed by Pilate and their blood was mingled with that sacrifice? And so what about these people that these great acts of vengeance, it looks like, came down upon from heaven? You know what Jesus said? Jesus basically ignored those people and said, unless you repent you'll all likewise perish. Friend, if there's one thing Jesus emphasized from the very moment He began His ministry, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John said it, Jesus said it, and from that point on, Jesus restricted the idea of repentance to being essential to really living for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, when we talk about the essentiality of repentance, it's kind of important for us to understand, no doubt, what that idea is. What do we mean by repentance? Is repentance just an outward show? I want to give you an illustration from the Old Testament that helps us to see that repentance is more than an emotional outward sign. Joel chapter 2, verse number 13. Joel said to the people who desperately needed to change their ways, Rend your hearts, not your garments. Now, friend, the Israelites had been great about having things that they thought exhibited true repentance. They might throw dust and ashes upon their head. They might pull out the hair from their head. They might sit among the ash pile as Job did in essence. They might pluck the hair out of their beard even. Was that something God wanted? God said, rend your hearts not your garments. True repentance is a changed way of thinking that leads to a changed way of acting. Acts 3 verse 19, Peter preached, Repent and turn, or be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Godly sorrow produces repentance. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse number 10, and so to really be what God wants me to, I've got to repent, meaning that I've got to amend my ways, see what God wants me to do, and turn to God and His will. Great example, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. About verses 6 through 10, Paul says of the Thessalonians that they had turned from idols to God to serve the true and living God. They stopped looking at idols, they turned in the right direction of God, and they started doing, serving God and doing exactly what He wanted them to do. Friend, let me mention to you another thing that Jesus was indeed narrow-minded about as it relates to His teaching. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was absolutely exclusive concerning the essentiality of baptism. I know that today we live in a, a world, in an environment, in an atmosphere religiously where people don't often see the importance of baptism. Some people will say, 
Baptism, yeah, that's something good you ought to do, but it, do you have to do it to be saved? To that they would answer no. Others would say, well, yeah, you ought to to be identified or become a member of a certain religious group, but not essential to salvation. Friend, regardless, and I want you to understand the way we're saying this, regardless of what men say, what matters for us today is, what does Jesus say? In John 12, verse 48, Jesus said, He who rejects me does not receive my word, has that which judges him. The word I've spoken will judge him in the last day. And so as we think about Jesus' teaching on the essentiality of baptism, please understand all that matters is what this book says, what God says, not what men say. Now, let's turn our attention to what Jesus did say. I want to direct your attention to a passage in the Gospel of John. And I'd like for you to look in John chapter 3 with me for just a moment. Look in John chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, listen to this now, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Friend, as we think about Christ's teaching on baptism, please listen very carefully to exactly what Jesus said. Jesus said, unless. That's restrictive. Jesus said, except. That expresses that there's one way, kind of. Jesus said, unless one is born of water, and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Is it essential that one be born of water to get into God's kingdom? Absolutely it is. And friend, that kingdom is the place of the saved. Let me give you a few other examples of this. One coming from the teaching of Jesus right before he gives or right after he gives the Great Commission. You remember the Great Commission, Mark 16, 15? Go into all the world. Preach the gospel unto every creature. Well, Lord, what do you want me to preach? He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. Friend, as you think about the teaching of Jesus on baptism, may I ask you to consider this. What is it Jesus said one must do to be saved? Listen to it again. He that believes will be saved. It's not what Jesus said. He that's baptized will be saved. That's not all of what Jesus said. What did Jesus say? He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Friend, if Jesus said you've got to believe and be baptized to be saved, why would anybody want to say it's not essential to salvation? Now, is that a theme that runs throughout the New Testament, indeed it is. You open to Acts chapter 2, and for the first time, God's saving gospel, the message of salvation in Jesus is going to be preached. Peter points out, you with lawless hands have killed Christ. They realize that. They've killed their own Messiah. They cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? They're cut to the heart. They want to know, what can I do to be saved? Repent and be baptized every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Acts 2, verse 38. Those who gladly received His word were baptized, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47. And so Peter taught baptism was for the remission of sins. Now friend, if we were really going to kind of get a, a picture of when it is that a person goes from being lost to saved, I don't think we could find a better example than that of the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 9, the Lord approaches Saul of Tarsus, whom we will later know as Paul. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Lord, who are you? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. 
Lord, what would you have me to do? Go in the city and be told what you must do. Acts 9 verses 1 through 6. We get the update on exactly what God said in Acts 22. God sends a message or a man named Ananias. Ananias comes to Saul and says, Saul, Saul, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Friend, it is sin that separates us from God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. The Lord's ears are not heavy that He cannot hear. His arms are not short that He cannot save. But your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. And so sin's that barrier that brings separation causes one to be lost. If I can know exactly when sin is removed, I can know when I'm saved. Listen again to Acts 22, 16. Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins. Sounds a lot like 1 Peter 3, 21. Peter said, Baptism does now also save us. Friend, if God's inspired word says, Baptism saves us, why would we dare say it's not essential to salvation? Do we realize that's how you get into Christ? Galatians 3, 27, As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ, and so please understand, Jesus did teach, except or unless one is born again, born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, as I think about things that Jesus really was restricted about, was definitely narrow-minded about, one of those was the fullness and the inspiration of God's inspired Word. In Matthew chapter 24, about verses 34 through 36, Jesus will say, Heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. Jesus will say in the Gospel of John that the Scripture cannot be broken. And Jesus later said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them praying to the Father. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Friend, as I think about things that Jesus definitely wanted us to stand firm upon. One of those is the inspiration of God's Word. Without the Bible, without understanding, without knowing and, and being fully committed to the fact that this book is absolutely word for word the Word of God, where is our faith? What faith do we have without that? This book is the foundation of our faith. In fact, Scripture affirms throughout it's inspiration. Listen to 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped unto every good work. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so, yes, Jesus absolutely affirmed God's inspired Word is something we need to stand firm upon. There's another great teaching that Jesus emphasized and definitely want us to be ready for, and it is His final coming. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, Jesus said, as He thought about His coming, as He answers that final question, Jesus made the wonderful statement that of that day and hour no one knows. Not even the Son, the Father in heaven is the only one who knows that. Is Christ going to come again? He absolutely is. The day the Bible teaches there is a day coming when Jesus will come back to this earth and we desperately need to be ready for that great day. That there will be great sound according to 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 through 16. The shout, the voice of the trumpet, the voice of an archangel and the dead in Christ will arise. We'll meet Him in the air. Friend, the truth is that God has sent His Son to this earth to save mankind and Christ is coming back to claim His own, and ultimately the world will be destroyed at that point. And so I want to live in view of that and always be ready to be with the Lord. Jesus said, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch and be ready. Friend, tying that idea into, that idea into the fact that Christ is one day going to come back into Jesus' words in John 14, 6, helps us to see our need to truly follow Christ and do what He says. Do you remember it? We began with this verse. John 14, verse 6, Jesus said, 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Friend, is there any other way to be saved outside of Christ? He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. Outside of Jesus, you cannot. It is impossible to get to the Father. That's why God sent His Son. God so loved the world. He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. He made salvation available so that all of us could one day live with the Father in heaven. Friend, it's God's desire that all men be saved. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4, God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. He, God's not slow concerning His promises as some men count slowness, but He's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, verse number 9. Friend, there's nothing wrong with having a definite, a definitive plan, a definitive way, something that I can be assured of. And Jesus does indeed provide us with that. And so today we ask of you, are you sure you're a child of God? Have you obeyed the blessed gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Have you heard the message that there is a Savior, that Jesus brought salvation to the world and that He's the only way? John 14, 6. Do you really believe in Christ as the Savior and the Son of God? John 8, verse 24. If so, are you willing to repent, turn from sin, and turn to God? Acts 3, verse 19. Would you confess the name of Jesus before men? Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. And would you do what Jesus said? He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark chapter 16, verse number 16. As always, we want our listeners to know that this message is motivated out of, a, out of a love for God and out of a love for souls. Why speak on things like this today? Because, friend, more than anything, God wants people to be saved. We want people to be saved. And we don't know how much time we've got. Let's make sure that we're ready to live with God for eternity before it's everlastingly too late. To redeem a people, you may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is taking the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we do and say. And unlike many other religious groups, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. His bride, this is the gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit us at thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com, call us at 580-798-7656, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.